I grew up in a very small town in Montana. During Halloween one year, my brother and I sold lemonade by the side of the road because it was unusually hot that year. We didn't make a lot of money, but we did have a lot of fun selling lemonade to people who were passing by. So my brother and I were standing at our lemonade stand when we noticed an old rusty car pass by us two or three times. At the time, it struck me as a little creepy. Eventually, the car slowed down and stopped right in front of the stand. There was a woman in the passenger seat, and she rolled her window down. I saw she was really skinny with gray hair, and it was stained and silky. It looked like it was nasty, honestly. I couldn't see the man who was driving very well because he never looked at me. He just stared straight ahead. Both of them seemed very odd, and their clothes were old and dirty. The lady smiled. You boys out here selling lemonade all by yourselves? Asked the woman. Yeah, my mom lets us, I replied. Is your mom home? She asked. Yeah, she's in the house, I said. The woman turned and looked at the man who was driving. He nodded, still staring straight ahead. The woman turned back to me and said, Okay, I'll have some lemonade. That'll be 25 cents, I said as I poured her glass. She rummaged around in her purse, and I could hear coins clinking. Then she put out a $5 bill and held it to me. A chill went down my spine. Why was she handing me a $5 bill if she had coins in her purse? Something just didn't feel right. So I lied and said I don't have any change. She said, you can keep the change. Just come and take the $5. Something felt very wrong, but $5 was a lot to me at the time. I walked up to the car and reached out to take the $5 from her hand. As soon as my fingers touched it, the woman suddenly grabbed me by my wrist and began pulling me into the car. I screamed so loud my brother ran to the house yelling for help. The man floored the accelerator and the car lurched forward. I fought with all my might and managed to wrench myself free from her grasp. The car stopped and the man got out, but I was already running for my life. My brother was pounding on the door and screaming. My mother rushed out and turned just in time to see the rusty old car speeding away. We told my mom what had happened and she called the police. When my brother and I calmed down and went back to the lemonade stand, there was a $5 bill lying on the ground. We packed up the lemonade stand and put it away for good. The year was 2018. I love Halloween more than most. As a child, I loved it. As an adult, even more. In 2015, I started to go trick-or-treating again in my neighborhood. As a short adult, and using a concealing costume, I'm a woman. I was able to do it year after year without incident, until 2018. That year, I used my favorite costume, a homemade zombie outfit with a skull mask. For the record, by this time I was over 30, but trick-or-treating was fun for me. My childhood neighborhood was too rough to trick-or-treat in. Anyway, I've been out for over two hours going house to house, getting lots of goodies. By this time, I was sweating pretty heavily, forcing me to pause and dry under my mask occasionally. Soon I rounded a street corner and passed a man walking two dogs. The street was clear and many houses were unlit. I took a few steps forward and paused. Suddenly, standing in a house's pathway was an old lady. Where exactly did she come from? She wasn't there before. She looked to be in her mid-70s, with white hair, sweater, skirt, low-heeled shoes. She smiled as she approached me, standing in front of me. She said, hello, dear. Are you out trick-or-treating? Come with me and I'll get you some candy. I said to her, thank you, but I don't have to. She chuckled warmly like I said something funny. Nonsense. Come with me and we'll get you some candy, sweetie. For some reason, I decided to follow her. As we walked together, I suddenly realized something. My shoes made noise as we walked, while hers didn't make any noise. Two houses down, she paused and said, go on, dear. I'll wait here for you. I did the trick-or-treat routine, then turned to thank her. 
I froze in shock. The old woman was no longer standing there. There's no way she could have left without me hearing her. I asked the man in the doorway if he'd seen her. Puzzled, he asked, her, you came alone. There's no one with you. Confused, I said, I must have been seeing things. I walked home wondering what had happened. After 10 minutes, I stopped in my tracks and chuckled to myself, saying to myself, holy crap, I just saw a ghost. My name is Brent and this happened when I was 11 years old, when I lived in a somewhat sketchy neighborhood. This took place on Halloween with a friend of mine named Carlos. Me and Carlos were best friends since the second grade and there was a two-story house rumored to be hunted near us. We decided that it would be a good idea to test out the rumor, which had seemed obviously fake to us at the time, or so we thought it had been fake. We went trick-or-treating and then left our candy at my friend Carlos' house. It was close to midnight, which was the time we intended to be at the house to make things a little scarier due to the fact that we love horror movies. It took us a while to get to the house, as it was a few houses away, and it was the second to the last house on the street. As we arrived at the house at around 11.56, me and my friend Carlos then thought it would be a good idea to trick or treat here, so we rung the doorbell. A man which looked to be in his mid-thirties dressed with a hoodie and ripped jeans answered the door almost right away. My friend then mentioned the rumor of his house being hunted. We laughed it out and he used a poor excuse which we bought at the time, which was that he was a very messy and unorganized man. He then said, you kids are almost a little late for Halloween. It's going to end in two minutes. It's almost 12 a.m. He said the candy was in the room and he offered us to come in. Us being really anxious at the time, took the offer to not be rude. We sat in the living room on the couch, waiting for the man as he went upstairs. Carlos's mom then texted him to ask if we were going to have a sleepover that night, which he replied with yes. As the man was coming back, he insisted on us going upstairs because he had Reese's, which was my favorite candy at the time. So me being a pretty mindless 11 year old, I took the offer. As we went upstairs and into his hardly lit up room, it appeared as if the man collected knives. We saw it as a pretty cool hobby and the man gave us each two Reese's chocolates. We then thanked the man. As we were going downstairs, my friend Carlos fell down the stairs screaming in pain. I turned around and the man was holding what appeared to be a red knife, which was probably one of the ones from his collection. My fight or flight was immediately activated and I punched the man in the face. He stabs my leg, but I managed to hold on in pain and knock him out with five punches. I take the knife out of my leg and start limping away holding Carlos, and we get out. I call the police and they arrest the man a while after he wakes up. The ambulance takes me and Carlos to the hospital. I was fine after two days, but Carlos was apparently stabbed twice in the back and was bleeding out. He took about a week or two in the hospital to recover. A while after getting out of the hospital, the police told us about the man's past. He was a registered sex offender. I never again went inside a stranger's house, and to this day I fear what could have happened if I was not able to hold on in pain from being stabbed. On Halloween when I was in the fourth grade, I stayed home sick from school. I was lying on the couch watching Hocus Pocus when I heard the doorbell ringing. It was the postman. He told me I had a package to deliver, but it was so big that he needed me to help him carry it in. I don't know why, but I knew something wasn't right. I didn't see his truck parked out front, and when I asked him where it was, he told me it was around the corner. I asked him why the regular postman wasn't here, and he said he was visiting family. He kept telling me to open the front door. I said I was sick and I wasn't allowed to leave the house. I told him my parents would pick up the package from the post office but he said that would be too much hassle and told me my mom would want me to take the package now. I told him I had to get my shoes first and then I would come out and help him. Then I closed the front door, locked it, and ran to the back door and locked that one too. I called our neighbor who was a close family friend and begged her to come over to my house right now. 
Then I stood at the front window and stared at the man. When he saw me, he yelled through the door asking if I found my shoes yet. I yelled back, telling him that I called my neighbor to come and help carry the package because she was older and stronger. At that point, he just turned around and ran off. They never caught the guy, and I always wonder if he ever managed to trick some other kid. The story took place about a year ago. Me and my three friends, Saul, Fernando, and AJ, decided to take a trip to Universal Studios for the yearly event, Halloween Horror Nights event. The trip to our destination was not too long, so we got there in about two hours or so. When we got there, it was full of guests, but we managed to enjoy the rest of the day and got to go through different attractions and mazes. The theme park was set to close at 2 a.m. So we started heading back to our town. We took the ramp to the freeway and began our way back once again. I was so tired from walking all day, we were all falling asleep, except for my friend Fernando, of course. He was the driver. One hour on the road and we decided to stop at a nearby Denny's off the freeway. We went inside, ordered food and ate. It was all normal once again. A few guests were still eating too, and it was almost 3 a.m. We finished our meals, paid, and went out the door to the parking lot. As we stepped outside, I noticed a strange man standing next to a car across from ours. He just looked like he was staring blankly at us. From what I could see was that he was wearing a trench coat. As we were about to get into the car, the man started walking slowly toward us. And there I could notice a long scar across his face. Suddenly my friend Saul asked the man, yo, did you lose something? The stranger stood there with an evil-like smile and slowly started taking a knife out of his pocket. We all hurried back into the car and told our friend Fernando to floor it. As we were exiting the parking lot, I turned my head back and noticed that the guy was still standing there waving his knife at us. I'm just thankful that this story didn't end up worse, because God knows what plans that man had. Honestly, that was just a weird experience. My name is Eric and this happened to me when I was around seven or eight years old. One summer, my dad took me to a campsite for a long weekend. When we arrived, there were some kids around my age playing in a small park. I looked at my dad and he said, go ahead. So my dad unpacked the car and I went to maybe make some friends. There were two boys in a small park. I said hello and they said hello back. Their names were Kevin and Graham. Graham had to go shortly after because his parents were calling for him. So Kevin and I hung around and we talked about things we liked and how long we were staying at the campsite. After about an hour, Kevin's mom was calling for him, so we had to leave. I was about to head back to my dad when a boy appeared from the woods. He said hello. I said hi back. He introduced himself as Daniel. He seemed like a nice kid and we got along pretty well. He asked me if I wanted to play hide and seek, so I said yes. We played hide and seek at the campsite for maybe 45 minutes until I told him I had to go, so I went back to my dad and went to the camper. I told my dad I had made some friends and my dad asked where their campers were. I told him where Kevin and Graham's were, but I never asked where Daniel was. I thought maybe, well, I'll see him the next day and I'll ask him then. So the next day I went outside to see if any of the kids wanted to play. Kevin and Graham were both unavailable. I was about to just return back to my camp room when Daniel appeared out of nowhere, out the woods. We greeted each other and I asked him if he wanted to play hide and seek again. He said, yeah, but he said, we should play at his house. I asked him where his house was. And he told me it's not far, it's just through the woods. I followed Daniel in the woods toward his house. We were walking for ages and one thing that I found unusual was, the more we walked, the less talkative and distant Daniel became. Eventually, we exited the woods, and Daniel said, here we are. He pointed at a rundown old house with a white van parked beside it. He started walking toward it. I slowly followed and asked Daniel, so this is your house? He replied by saying, yeah, let's go play hide and seek. I got this bad feeling. 
and it became worse the closer we got to the house. It didn't look like a normal house. I started to notice that there were people standing by the windows inside the house. I asked Daniel if that was his dad in the window. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about him. He's harmless. And just continued walking. I don't know what it was, but something made me slow down. Daniel was by the front door at this point. And when he turned around, asked me if I was coming. I told him I had to go. I turned around and ran through the forest and back to my camper. I spent the next few hours watching TV. Then I got bored and decided to go back outside. I knocked on Graham's door, but he wasn't available. I knocked on Kevin's door and his dad told me he was already out with some boy named Daniel. So I went back to the camper and did something else with my time. Late that night, there was a knock on our door. It was Kevin's parents. They asked us if we had seen Kevin anywhere as he's been gone for hours. I asked his mom if she had checked Daniel's house, and she said no because she didn't know where Daniel lived. I showed Kevin's parents along with my dad and a few other people through the woods to Daniel's house. When we got there, the van was gone. And when we knocked on the door, there was no answer. And the whole house was empty and abandoned. We didn't find Kevin for the rest of our time at the campsite, and he's still missing to this day as far as I know. I thought then, and still think today that Daniel was some kind of bait to lure kids in the same age as him to be kidnapped. And I'm thankful my gut sensed danger and told me to leave. My name is Jack and growing up my younger brother and I, who's two years younger than me, had a complicated and somewhat difficult childhood. I won't go too much into details, private and personal, but there were a lot of occasions where my brother and I, whose name is Brian we move around the country a lot and live with different relatives and sometimes friends. This one time, I think I was about 10 and Brian was eight. Our dad was driving us across the country for a reason I can't remember. I don't know what time it was, but I know it was dark and late. When we finally stopped for the night at a motel, it was even darker. After checking into our room, which was on the ground floor, our dad said he was leaving to do something and he'll be back soon. He said he'll bring back a pizza and told us to not leave the room. There was nothing to do in our room and we didn't know how to work the TV, so I suggested that we play hide and seek. Brian was to be the seeker. I left the room and ran upstairs to the floor above us, around the corner behind an ice machine and waited. I had a clear view over the motel and could see Brian looking around for me. I remember standing behind the ice machine giggling and watching my brother walk around the motel in the pool area looking for me. Then the door behind me slowly creaked open revealing a large man that looked to be in his late 40s, had a dirty white tank top on, and he seemed overweight. He asked me in a friendly voice what I was doing. I told him I was just playing hide and seek. He then asked me if I was playing with my parents. I told him no, just my younger brother. At this point, Brian was upstairs and found me talking to the man. The man asked if our parents knew we were playing hide and seek. Brian spoke up and said, no, our dad left us. The man then asked Brian and I if we wanted to come inside to watch cartoons, and he had some cookies and milkshakes for us as well. Me and Brian looked at each other and then looked back at the man and said, okay. And we entered the man's motel room. We sat down on the bed and the man turned the TV on and he put on some cartoons. I can't remember what cartoons it was though. He then said he would be right back and was going to get our milkshakes and cookies. The man went into the bathroom. I got up and I took a look into the bathroom to see what the man was doing. I was confused at why he didn't go in the kitchen. He had two glasses of water and then put a little bit of white powder in each glass. Thinking at the time it was just the ingredients to make a milkshake. I sat back down on the bed. When the man finally came out of the bathroom, he handed me and Brian a glass each. He said, here's your milkshakes. It didn't look like milkshakes at all. At least not one that I've ever had. It looked like it was just water with white powder floating around. I suddenly had this bad feeling in the pit of my stomach telling me I was definitely in danger and we needed to leave. Brian was about to take a sip of his drink. I stopped him, and the man was still watching us, just silent. Out of nowhere, 
The man just asked us, what's wrong? Drink your milkshake. This time in a much less friendlier tone than he had been speaking to us before. I looked at the man and he was looking at me, waiting for me to speak. I then said, we always eat cookies first before we drink our milkshakes. The man let out an irritated sigh and went back into the bathroom. I put the glass down on the floor and quietly did the same with Brian's. I grabbed Brian's arm and quickly exited the man's room. We ran around the corner and down the stairs into our motel room. I turned out the lights and I kept watch out the window. After about five minutes, the man came down the stairs and started his car. I was feeling a bit of a relief, thinking he was just about to leave the motel. But he got out of the car and looked directly at the window I was looking through and started approaching our room. I remember panicking at the moment, thinking that the man was about to take us. He was getting closer to our door when our dad pulled up and asked the guy what he was doing. The man didn't say anything and just walked away and went to his car and drove off. We never saw him again. When our dad asked us who that man was, we told him we didn't know. Brian and I never spoke about this incident again to anyone. I sometimes have nightmares about if we did drink that man's drink and what would have happened to us if we did or if our dad didn't come back in time. When my grandfather was younger, he became the principal of an elementary school. He was in his late 20s, early 30s at the time, and despite being young, he was a born leader. He was a great principal and everyone loved him. I can attest to that as I attended multiple award ceremonies for him and the respect and admiration he received was crazy. There was a young boy at the school who was having behavioral issues in class, and my grandfather saw that the kid didn't have a lot of parental support. So he called in his father and had talked with him about spending more time with his son in just a general parenting session. It turned out that all the boy needed was his dad's attention and after a few weeks he was a happy model student. Whenever my grandfather would leave school late, he would see the dad was playing basketball with his son after he got home from work. It was one of those moments that he took pride in being able to make a difference in people's lives. However. Not everything had such an easy solution, and my grandfather found himself having to deal with an employee, Stanley the janitor, who was showing up to work drunk. Stanley was an alcoholic, with a mean streak, and my grandfather tried on multiple occasions to deal with his behavior. Finally, one day Stanley showed up so drunk that my grandfather sent him home and called the superintendent to let him know he was going to be firing him the next morning after he sobered up. He then warned them to let him deal with it when Stanley was sober because he was not a stable person. As it goes in these kinds of stories, the superintendent was furious and decided that he was going to call Stanley himself and fire him despite my grandfather's warning. No one called my grandfather to tell him about it either so he was completely in the dark and thought he could deal with it in the morning. Stanley was furious and went to the school that evening. He searched the offices, my grandfather's included, and tore things apart until he finally had what he wanted. He was in a blaze of fury and on his way out, he saw the father and his son playing basketball. He walked towards them and pulled something out of his trousers. It was a gun. He then proceeded to shoot the little boy killing him instantly. The father was so upset, was hysterically crying but somehow managed to get the gun away from Stanley and shoot him. My grandfather was called to the elementary school immediately by the police because there were two dead bodies. The little boy and Stanley were dead. What was even worse was the crying from the father and him saying that he couldn't save his son. It was clear that he could never forgive himself for that day. My grandfather was pulled aside by one of the police who would search Stanley for evidence. They had found a list, a hit list of people that he was going to kill and all the addresses of those people that he had retrieved when he searched the offices. My grandfather was number one on that list. So, if it weren't for that father, it's likely that I would never been able to meet my grandfather and possibly my mother and grandmother would have been killed if Stanley had been able to complete his mission. To this day, 
I get goosebumps whenever I hear that story, and it's just so chilling. My grandfather never uttered a single word about this after his initial recount, and my mother made me swear to never tell him I knew. He carried the weight of that boy's death on him until the day he died. <laughs>